Hi, this is Tim and Dole. Welcome to Midwest Hunting and Outdoors by Two Dumbasses. A podcast about the outdoors, hunting, and being a steward of the land. Hey, what um, technology, crazy technology changes, right, um, in the last decade, and, you know, it's only accelerating. What, what technology changes have you seen that you're using? And if you had your crystal ball here, what, you know, what would be Tyler's vision to improve this process using technology? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So <clears throat> I'm sure, you know, I think all of us have been around long enough to know when the mandatory reporting system came into place in Iowa, right? 2006 is when we switched from that, uh, from the uh, harvest reporting it used to be done via a mail postcard. So we would send postcards out, individuals to a, to a <clears throat> random sample of hunters. Hunters would send those postcards back saying, <clears throat> yeah, I harvested one deer, I harvested two deer, you know, whatever. Now, now we have this uh, mandatory reporting where you can call in, you can send a text message, all these things that we talked about, do it on the app. Uh, that's, that's a, a pretty amazing technological change for us and the benefit um, for us in that regard is that we get we get that harvest information that much quicker which is great because that means I can start to summarize it right away I can start to make those decisions right away um, because that process like what we were talking about I mean I just finished it in July in, in June July so so those county antlerless quotas are finalized basically right before we print the hunting regulations so it's not a quick process it takes a lot of time so the faster we can get that information in, the better. Now, are there some downsides to that mandatory reporting? Sure. And one of those we already talked about, you know, is the reporting rate. We know not everybody reports. And with the mandatory reporting, it's, it's hard for us to determine what that reporting rate is. Because if you, Joel, harvest a deer, you call it in, you report it, I know Joel harvested a deer. But if you purchase a tag and you don't call and report on that tag, that could be one of two outcomes. That could be you harvested a deer and you didn't report it, or you didn't harvest a deer. And I don't know which one of those outcomes comes from that without chatting with you. And so that's one of the downsides of the mandatory reporting. But we can use these studies and, and other efforts to try to estimate that on reporting rate and, and help, help inform that. Uh, one of the other things that we've been uh, using now in the DNR that is actually just kind of blown up since I started three years ago is the, uh, the use of smartphones and tablets for data collection. Uh, so we have our spring spotlight survey, for example, which is another survey that we use to count deer on an annual basis, happens in the spring, March, April. Um, that survey, the data used to be collected the good old traditional way, piece of paper and a GPS unit with a range finder, we'd go out and we'd, we'd count deer, we'd see how far they are from, from roadways so it's a it's a transect based road based survey and we'd write, write that out all down on a piece of paper and then somebody would have to go in and enter all of those data it would take months to process those data now <clears throat> we can whip out our smartphone or our tablet our field staff will drive down the road they see a deer they touch a point on an on an aerial photo say there's three deer there hit submit move on those data are automatically uploaded to the cloud, to a, to a cloud database. They're already entered. We've taken the, the data processing time from three months to probably three hours for me. Um, and is that survey as a <coughs> index, uh, an additional index just to confirm, you know, hey, yeah, I think the data <coughs> is the, and the assumptions that we're using are, are correct? Absolutely, okay. yep, that's, that's one more, one more uh, index that we have to, to inform not just deer populations, but we count other critters as well, and in fact, that survey and our, and our archery hunter survey are two surveys that, that really provide us some of the only data that we have for some, for some critters, like bobcats or badgers or some of the other fur-bearing species. Do we do any indices on raccoons? So the, the, spot, the, the spring spotlight survey, yeah. in fact, was actually started as the rac raccoon spotlight survey. When the survey was started in 1978, it was initiated to count raccoons. And at that time, 
um, raccoon populations, harvest was dropping, or well, harvest was, was increasing, population was dropping, there was lots of concerns that, that we were potentially over harvesting raccoons. So the spotlight survey was born. We needed, we needed something to tell us what raccoon populations were doing. We had the harvest data, but we needed an independent index to validate what the harvest data were telling us. Spotlight survey was born in 1978. A couple years later, somebody decided, hey, I've seen a lot of deer on this survey. Maybe we should count deer too. And, and now we've kind of grown it to count raccoons, badgers, deer. So you're still surveying raccoons? We're still, we're still running the spotlight survey every year. Well, I can tell you right now what the survey is saying. Right? <laughs> what got, do you think it's saying? We've got an overabundance. We've got a large population of raccoons. We need it's, a raccoon pandemic. <clears throat> it's bad. We got a big population, but actually the trend for raccoons is, is down, going down. Well, That's not, true for true for. Not doing of, a survey around my place, I don't <laughs> think so. Man, hey, oh, it's man, just oh, a man. survey, right? Yeah, we're not yeah. counting them all. Sampling population. That's right. So. That's right. All right. Um, Last question on this, and then let's move on to the other surveys that we've talked on and the other functions of your job. Sure. Um, so, again, using technology in the future, you know, what is there anything out there that hey, you know, we're we're trying to learn about, or we think there might be some potential, but we don't know what exists. For example, drone technology or FLIR <clears throat> technology or any of those type of things that would help in data collection. Yeah, great question. And that's, um, you know, one of the things that we try to do is we're constantly trying to improve what we do and explore these other options, drones being one of them. Tons of fun. I'm sure both of you, maybe you've flown a drone, maybe you haven't. If you haven't, I strongly encourage it. It's, it is a ton of fun to fly one. You know, it just brings out the kid in all of us, you know, <laughs> re remote control car days, except for they're a lot more sophisticated. They're a blast. But anyway, yeah, we've, we have, uh, we've, we've talked at length about how we can utilize drone technology for, for different types of surveys, um, perhaps on our spotlight survey, maybe even on more localized surveys. Um, you know, one of the things uh, that a, sur a survey that's used quite frequently that we don't actually use in Iowa anymore, but aerial surveys, helicopter surveys for deer. <clears throat> and I'm sure you both here, you know, aerial surveys are, are the, the number one killer of, of wildlife biologists in the nation. In fact, a, a, a colleague of mine down in Texas uh, just a couple weeks ago died from a helicopter crash doing a bighorn sheep survey. Really? Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, I didn't know that. They you mean <clears throat> crashes? Crashes. Yep. I did not. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. They're the. They are the the number one number one killer of wildlife biologists. And so, we, you know, we don't use them in Iowa anymore. But, um, but drones, you know, could be an opportunity to to get get biologists out of the air but s still conduct a similar survey. Well, and think of the cost effectiveness. Right? Yeah, I mean, cost savings for sure. Yeah, Because I, mean, I was, I mean, I would be <clears throat> thinking, I was thinking, you know, what if you do drone surveys, but I mean, with the forward looking infrared at night, yep. any heat signatures are going to get picked up. And I mean, what better way of, you know, surveying an area and see what the deer or I could tell you what raccoon population is again. Let's not get me started there, but I mean, I would think that would be like a very cheap, ineffective, but an accurate way of doing it. Yeah, and, and the advances in FLIR technology have just been fantastic in the last ten years. And and you know we've talked about it here in in Iowa. Haven't taken any steps to really explore that yet. But I know that there are. Um, excuse me. I have colleagues in in Minnesota. They're exploring the use of, of FLIR technology on their spotlight surveys because these are surveys conducted at night. You know they're comparing what's being seen with just the standard old spotlight with what they're seeing on FLIR and, and how that, how that compares. And so there's, yeah, there's technologies out there that could, that could improve It's a free this. one. If you ever get that one, it's okay. You don't have to, I won't, you know, you don't have to get my I'll get, signature I'll, on I'll give you credit. Yeah. Yeah. Credit. No, you don't even need to do that. Just you know, get rid of an extra raccoon or two. I'd be happy. All right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. One of the other technologies that, that, um, that we're recently exploring that shows uh, quite a bit of promise is trail cameras. Uh, there, there are actually statistical methods now, um, and uh, we've been involved here with, with kind of testing some of these methods, and, and many of the methods have been uh, developed by scientists, you know, uh, all across the, the country, but uh, using trail cameras to collect images and then using those images to try to estimate populations of different critters. And so we're, we're testing the use of, 
of trail cameras uh, here in Iowa for estimating deer and turkey populations. Uh, in fact, I just submitted a, a proposal with hopes of getting some funding to, to further uh, that testing because they're, you know, they're, they're inexpensive. They, they can be deployed across a variety of spatial scales. We can use them on individual landowners' properties for helping get density estimates for, for management. They're you know. non-invasive. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so there's, there's lots, of, lots of perks to the use of, of trail cameras. And so I think that that's, that's really the, uh, you know, in addition to drones, that's a, a technology that shows some some really that's, great promise. I didn't for even use think of that. That's an awesome state yeah. agencies. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you can't pick up a hunting magazine without reading an article about how to estimate <clears throat> your population of your deer, you know, and there's yeah. formulas and everything else and how to do it, right? So yeah. So I do have a couple questions. Uh, so one thing you, you mentioned colleagues up in Minnesota. So just for our listeners, I know we, we do a lot of talking to folks here in Iowa, but to what degree do you speak to colleagues? In the rest of the Midwest, when you're managing your herd, et cetera. So, I have my thoughts, but I'm perspective. Oh, I'd I'd love to hear hear your thoughts. I I speak with colleagues weekly, um, in in other states, and in fact, uh, just yesterday I spent the entire day on a conference call. Um, it's part of a group called the Midwest Deer and Turkey Study Group. So it's a it's basically all of the uh, deer and turkey biologists from the 13 Midwest states. Every year we get together, uh, we talk about hot topics, what we're seeing in our state, what's going on, uh, you know, obviously those conversations, uh, CWD comes up a lot, disease-related issues comes up a lot, um, you know, what are we seeing in hunting trends, hunter trends, those sorts of things, but yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking with, with a colleague in another state weekly, you know, That's if whether awesome. it be conversations about, about what they're seeing in the deer population, conversations about, um, you know, research ideas, how we can leverage information across state boundaries to, to better inform what we're doing. Uh, this grant proposal I mentioned to try to test these, these camera trap technologies had, um, had colleagues from South Dakota, Minnesota, Michigan, Wisconsin, uh, and Missouri all, all involved in this effort with hopes that we can, we can, you know, we can pool our resources to try sure. to uh, try to get good information that's awesome i mean yeah. so i wanted to bring that out because i know we do a lot of talking with folks from iowa and but i know where our listeners are from elsewhere I mean, we even have a listener from uh ireland of all places and uh but i wanted to prove out that hey i think what we're doing here <clears throat> is representative of the midwest and that's really our niche yep. um the other piece is, is so you said cameras right camera technology so my my antenna went up there a little bit sure what what kind of brand are you guys looking at oh so not, first off, we don't have any sponsors on cameras. We are currently looking at a couple, but we have. We're no talking chainsaws. We can talk chainsaws because we're trying to get steel on board. Oh, not, yeah. No one's called us yet, but we're trying. But uh, so cameras. Yeah. So so we um, we don't look as much at the brand as we look at what it what it can do for us. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and so so the the cameras, at least with the methods that we've been testing so far. Um, the statistical methods require a, a camera that can can do um, time lapse photography. So sure. we can set it up to take photos every 30 minutes, every 40 minutes, however long we want. Yeah, like and, them. And not not every camera can do that. Yep. And so really, what we're what we're looking at is um, you know the the features of the camera. So right now we've the, the cameras that we're using for a project that we're on are actually spy point cameras, mm -hmm. uh, the Force 11D, which I think they've discontinued. Uh, but it's been a really great camera for us. It can take time lapse and motion, uh, motion photography. Uh, so that's been a that's been a good camera for us. But um, you know, I know a lot of a lot of folks that are doing similar uh, research with with cameras. Uh, use Reconyx cameras. Uh, you know, I've seen research using Bushnell cameras. I mean, I think it. There's really not one brand necessarily that serves the purpose. It's just what 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 are the features of the camera? And sure. What what can we get? So uh, offline, because we're in talks with some of these camera manufacturers as we speak, uh, so I don't want to bring them up right now, but sure. offline, let's talk. I, I think we might have some, some thoughts or insights, yeah. maybe. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And it's, it's, a, you know, it's a, really, a really neat um, technology, and like I said, I'm just excited about uh, the possibilities that, that can bring. You know, I mean, we know every, everybody likes to put out trail cameras, right? Hunters, non-hunters alike, we all like 
putting out trail cameras that are a blast. They're a great tool for citizen engagement. If we can get the information that we need to help manage populations, uh, it's it's a it's a win win. Yeah, you know, yeah that it. seems like a no brainer. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, Tyler, that was uh, that's a big chunk of your function and your job, but you've got at least a couple other functions that you've mentioned. Um, um, let's revisit um, and educate us on what you do with EHD and CWD. Yeah, sure. So, so uh, chronic wasting disease is is a, a big part of my job, and as the as the deer program leader, um, you know, I'm responsible for helping coordinate what's our what's called our chronic wasting disease response and management plan. Uh, so again, for uh, for the listeners, if you don't remember, uh, chronic wasting disease, it's a, a neurodegenerative disease, meaning it attacks the central nervous system of deer and, and other relatives, so elk, um, as an example. Uh, it was first found in Iowa in 2013 in the wild herd up in Alamakee County, and we found it in uh, seven additional counties in the state since, since 2013. So it's kind of slowly spreading uh, throughout the state. Uh, it's a disease that that um, is is very concerning uh, for lots of reasons. One of which I mentioned before it is 100% fatal for deer uh, that become infected. Uh, and what we're you know we're constantly learning about this disease every day, every day. But what we're what what the science suggests right now is that it's not going away anytime soon. And so what what we uh, at the Iowa DNR and what other states are doing is uh, that that are affected by this disease is is, is finding out what are the best ways to, to manage a population to try to minimize the impact of this disease as much as possible. And so that's a really big part of, of my job on an annual basis. And what, what did, physically, what does that mean? I mean, are you, you walk us through, what, is it, what does that mean? Can you give us some examples? Yeah, absolutely. So, so a big part of that is surveillance, trying to figure out where the disease is in the state. Uh, we've been doing uh, surveillance in Iowa for the disease since 2002. Um, that was when it was first discovered, basically in the Midwest and, and up in Wisconsin. And so we've been sampling deer, uh, and by sampling deer, I mean we're, we're sampling hunter-harvested deer. Uh, we we pull uh, what are called the retropharyngeal lymph nodes, which are the lymph nodes in your neck that you kind of feel get swollen up if you've got a cold or, or the flu or something like that. We're pulling those lymph nodes from the deer. We send them to a lab, and they, um, they test for that infectious prion that I mentioned before, uh, and that determines whether the deer is, is positive or not. So we've been sampling in that manner uh, since 2002. 2013 was when we first picked it up in wild deer, and we've been really increasing our sampling efforts since then. So a big part of my job in, in coordinating that response and management plan is essentially informing which deer we want to sample and where we want to sample. To, to try to um, to try to detect this disease, a, a big part of of managing this disease is to to f find it early. You know, we want to detect it if it's in the state, if it's in a part of the state. We want to try to detect it as quickly as possible because the earlier you find it, the more time you have to implement a management strategy in that area. And so that surveillance component is is really really important. And, and going to the regs um, here, I, maybe it's the first year I've noticed it, but um, it looks like this year there's actually a special certain counties or certain zones. I think a 13 or 16 zones that there's special antlerless tags available um, design to to pull samples off this uh, of these deer. Yeah, exactly. So that that is that's another part of our response is once once we find a, a a positive deer in an area, the first thing that we generally do is implement what we call a disease management zone around that positive. And generally, it's about a five mile radius around that positive. Science is starting to tell us that we probably want to increase that out to about a ten mile radius, which is what we've been doing in some of our more recent positives. And what that zone does for us is, as you mentioned, Joel, <clears throat> will allocate, generally allocate additional antlerless licenses uh, to that zone. And that serves two purposes. One, as we mentioned before, it helps reduce deer densities within that core area around where we detected that positive because we know that we want to manage that population at the low end of the goal to try to minimize the spread of that disease because it is spread between uh, deer to deer via direct contact. The other thing that we do with those licenses is we encourage hunters that, that take advantage of those, of those additional licenses to submit a sample for us. Because what that does is helps us really pinpoint where the disease is. And our hope is 
that that one deer is the only deer that we detect in that that area. Um, you know, sometimes that's the case. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes we figure out, oh shoot, here's one here and here's one here, and then what that allows us to do is kind of adjust that disease management zone boundary to try to manage the spread of of that disease. So that's that's been our response uh, ever since we had our first positive in 2013 in Alamakee County. Like you said, we've we've got a, a several zones in place this year, um, mostly around where we've detected those positive deer. Cool. And so, if if hunters or anyone in our audience, um, you know, was interested in, you know, applying or su supporting this effort, what what advice could you give them? Yeah, I mean, the, the the biggest advice I could give is if you're you know if you're interested in in taking advantage of those licenses, um, you know we we strongly encourage. In fact, for some of those licenses, it's mandatory that you submit a tissue sample for for the surveillance program. Uh, but even if you don't utilize those antlerless licenses within those disease management zones, we we conduct surveillance statewide, regardless of whether we find we found chronic wasting disease in an area or not. So just, I really encourage hunters to, uh, if you're interested in participating, you know, we appreciate those samples because it's just more information for us. And they can get that information on the website. <clears throat> I think there's even information in the reg book. In the reg book, yep. You can contact your local biologist or conservation officer. They'll be able to put you in contact with the, with the right person. Yeah, certainly very important and timely work. Um, around these terrible diseases it is yeah you know and it's it's a like i said it's a disease that's not going away and so if you think about where we're going to be three five ten years from now with chronic wasting disease uh, the interesting thing about this disease is that we're learning so much almost every day you know about what this disease does and and how can we best management manage it um, you know there are several states in the midwest that are dealing with this disease much like we are and so that's another reason why i'm conversing with colleagues in other states on a regular basis but but there you know there are a few things um, regardless of what we learn about chronic wasting disease in the future and how it impacts our management there's a few things that are um, that that we're going to strive for you know now and 10 years from now and and the first of which is what i already mentioned joel uh, surveillance, early detection. We want to try to pick it up as quickly as possible. And so that's where hunters play a really important role in helping us collect tissue samples. Um, you know, with, with the exception of those antlerless licenses and those disease management zones, we do, you know, the, the sampling is voluntary. Uh, you don't have to submit a sample if you don't want to, but we, we really encourage you to do so for that, for that purpose. Um, you know, the a couple other goals that we have that are really big in our response plan is we want to try to slow the spread of the disease and we want to minimize introduction of the disease in into new areas in the state. And a couple things that, that hunters or citizens can do to help us do that. Uh, the first of which is we encourage folks to refrain from baiting and feeding deer um, during the off season. Uh, what we know about that is obviously it's going to congregate a lot of deer in a small area, right? And what that's going to do is it's going to increase that direct animal to animal contact, which is only going to contribute to the to the spread of the disease. And another big thing too is is um, try to minimize transport of of those harvested animals, so your your carcass transports. So if you're uh, you know if you're hunting in an area or traveling to an area where, you, where CWD has been established, we encourage folks to try to, try to um, you know, keep that carcass in the area. Don't take it back to, to um, you know, your house where there is no CWD and, and, and pitch it out, you know, pitch it out behind the, by, behind the barn after you field dress it or something like that. Those carcass transport um, issues are, are big as well for helping try to minimize the introduction of this disease in sure. new areas. Yeah, scary. Yeah, it, it really is, and it's, you know, you talk about a pandemic uh, in, in white-tailed deer. I don't know that, um, you know, CWD has certainly not reached the, the degree of a pandemic that what we're experiencing with, with COVID-19, but it is really interesting to see a lot of the, the parallels that we're hearing about in the news with how we're dealing with this COVID-19 pandemic in, in humans and how we're trying to deal with the, the CWD issue in, in, in deer. Social, social distancing. Right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. You can I just mean, train deer to be socially distanced. Right. And be okay right. And wear masks. You know, <laughs> if, well, yeah. And, and, you know, one of the things I always joke is that, you know, we close down restaurants and bars, right? I mean, that's basically like 
don't don't bait and feed no you know don't don't all go and no go to the feeders. the same place to eat yeah. right yeah. Um, because that's going to slow the spread so there's there's lots of interesting parallels for sure so well if, go I ahead have, Tim. i do have one question so going back to those uh what do you call them? cwd zones mm -hmm. uh, management zones yeah so right now i mean are we having problems selling those special tags in those areas depends on the zone uh yeah that um we very rarely sell out of those licenses in those zones. Um, and, and there could be a couple reasons for that. But, you know, one of the reasons is there, there are, you know, it's, it's a lot of additional licenses in a fairly, small fairly area. localized small area. Yeah. Um, you know, and so that's, that's a problem. Um, well, not necessarily a problem, but that's a consideration at least. Uh, the other thing that we're trying to do a better job of is, is to get the word out about these additional licenses to folks. And make sure that folks know that they're that they're available, that they can take advantage of them if they want to harvest, you know, a couple additional deer. Might not have the opportunity to do it in Story County or up in Northwest Iowa or something like that. They can take advantage of these additional licenses and, and help us out simultaneously by providing a sample. Now, would that be something... <clears throat> I mean, you you have the data on this. Would that be something like out of staters that are w trying to get a draw? Would that be something that they'd be interested in? It could be. Those licenses aren't currently available to to non-resident hunters, uh, mm -hmm. but the county antlerless licenses are. If if there's some left in the county, sure. Uh, but at at the present time, we have not made those licenses available to non-residents. Just thinking out loud, you know. Yeah. I mean, it might be consideration for yep. the future for sure. Yep. Shifting gears to a little lighter note, yeah, you know, kind of the third function here, right? Sure. Uh, and you mentioned this earlier, the bow hunting survey. Walk us through what that is, and um, you know what you, you kind of link that into the process already, uh, validating uh, one of the indexes for the, the you know the the deer um, county antlerless quotas, right? But, yeah. Uh, walk us through what that is. Sure, sure. So it's the bow hunter observation survey. Uh, started in the state in 2004. It's been ongoing since then, so a number of years now. Uh, the the primary reason that the survey was started was again an independent validation of the various data sets that we have that show us what the white-tailed deer population is doing in the state. But we're also counting other critters on that survey as well, much like the spotlight survey. We're counting bobcats. We're counting badgers. Raccoons. And and, ra and raccoons exactly. <laughs> And so, and so that again is is a, a, a very reliable data set on population trends for those critters. Uh, so we send out an eight and a half by eleven sheet of paper front and back to our archery hunters, uh, about eight thousand archery hunters, nine thousand archery hunters every year. Um, and those those hunters are a combination of of individuals that have expressed interest in participating in the survey, and individuals that have purchased archery licenses. Uh, for that given year so we kind of have a, a like a two-stage sampling design if if you will um, and we ask those those individuals to uh, essentially just keep a diary of of their observations in the stand so you know what days you go out how many hours are you spending in the stand how many critters are are you seeing they send those survey cards back we scan them in we use that data to to inform uh, population trends for wildlife. Yeah, it's pretty simple. It's actually kind of fun because it's it's almost like a uh, hunting log for yourself. Yeah, I've, I've done it um, multiple years and uh, never really understood the connection. Uh, now sure. I do. It really helps um, me understand how I'm helping or how the survey helps. Or honestly, I had kind of a little pessimistic view of, hey, what's this? I don't get it. Yeah, what do you need this yeah. data? And it's so, you know. Uh, I, wouldn't consider it super act, uh, accurate, right? But if it is in terms of reliability, it's the probably the number two most reliable data set that we have for white tail deer population probably, trends yeah. behind yeah. harvest. Yeah, yeah, the harvest and the boabs data. It's amazing how closely they correlate. Really? If harvest goes, in fact, well, so yeah. um, this year is a great example. Um, so EHD last summer, we see an eight percent decrease in harvest, uh, which you know, we would have expected, right? Get the, the bow hunter observation surveys numbers back, statewide deer numbers, guess what? Down 8%. Wow. Fast forward to the next spring, spring spotlight survey. We're counting deer on spotlight survey routes. Spring spotlight survey, statewide deer numbers, down 8%. Hmm. So we have three independent data sources that are all telling us down 8%. That's 
pretty so, robust. Yeah, it helps, right? Yeah. It helps with the it's a with trend the, line. The process. Yeah. It's, it's a, a trend line. That's right. <laughs> I'm still trying to get over the rudder, uh, 20% rudder. <laughs> trim tab. Trim tab. Trim tab. Um, anyway, what, um, what, I totally lost my train of thought here. Trim tab did it. I'm sorry. The trim tab did it. For so we talk. I'll share a little bit about statistics from the survey. Okay. How does that sound? Yeah, sure. So, and, and the reason I like to share this is because I, you know, I, I tout the, the, how much hunters help us from a harvest standpoint. But here's a little bit about how much hunters help us from the from participating in the survey. So we get about 2,000 to 2,500 of the 9,000 cards that we send out get returned to us every year. So that's 2,500 hunters that, that respond to this survey, about 25%-ish response rate. Um, they record, on average, about 80,000 hours of, of observation in the field. If you were to put my staff time, my time behind that, if, if, we, if we had staff in the field collecting 80,000 hours worth of observation, it would cost the agency about $2.1 million annually to conduct this survey. Right now it costs us, a, by the time we figure in mailing the cards out, getting them back, People's time entering the data, validating the data, costs us about twelve thousand dollars. No brainer on an annual basis. I mean, that's like forty full time people, right? Equivalent. And and like I said, it's one of the most robust data sets we have. For, for Any hopes of getting trends. this on a, in a in an app or a tablet form or anything like that? Great question, and the answer is resoundingly yes. Uh, we're we're actively exploring uh, what that would look like in an online framework. Um, you know, we've we've talked about apps. We've talked about web or you know smart device friendly websites. Uh, those seem to be winning right now, just because um, my understanding and I am no expert when it comes to app development. But you know, when you develop an app, you have to make it available on Androids and iPhones, and then apparently there's a lot of maintenance involved with apps. And so right now, our we're kind of leaning towards a, a website that's that's um, smartphone friendly. Sure. Yep. Um, and so, you know, then individuals, if, if, if you take your phone in the field with you, which I think most of us probably do, you can just punch it in on the phone right, while, be you're, so fantastic. right where you're standing out there. Yeah. So we're, we're looking into, into that for sure. Um, the other the thing that we're looking into with this survey is that uh, I always will get uh, inquiries from folks saying, hey, you know, that survey sounds really cool. Can I participate in it? And, and right now, because we use this, this um, statistically based sample design, uh, there's, there's no real great way for us to incorporate volunteers. But, but we're looking at how we can do that in the future. And our hopes is that once we, get, once we can push the survey out into an online format, that's going to make it much easier for us to send that survey out to lots of folks. You know, right now, it's... It, because we've got the survey paper, it's kind of hard to for somebody to say, "Hey, I want to participate," or you know, twenty thousand people say, "Hey, I want to participate." Then that means I have to send twenty thousand more surveys out. Uh, but if we can roll it out online, that's going to make that process a lot easier. And certainly appreciate the willingness of of folks to participate. Yeah, in that was a free one, by the way. You don't have to give me credit or anything. No, Often, I'm going to give you credit. I was sure. even thinking you know, throw that link to that survey right on the on the DNR app. So you just you don't even have to type anything in. You just go use the existing app, yeah. right? There so I go. get a little kudos for there that. Right? Yeah, little that's, kudos. That's a little great kudos. option as well. well Tyler, I want to thank you again for you know participating in our podcast. What a what a great time, first of all, and then second of all, just a wealth of information and knowledge. You know, we've we've kind of started a trend here in the last episodes of uh, kind of throwing a curveball at all our guests and. I know you're an outdoorsman and a hunter and things like that. So what is, uh, is there any special uh, event or something that's happened to you while you've been hunting or outdoors that you would consider a uh, dumbass moment that uh, you could share with our audience here? Or what's, you know, another way of saying it is what's kind of the craziest thing that's happened to you or you've been involved with while you've been hunting, good, bad, or indifferent? Oh my gosh. Let's think. Well, I mean, I've, I've had my fair share of dumbass moments in the field, I think, like <laughs> we, many of we us. We all have, have right? <laughs> yeah. um, and I'm struggling to really think of a good one right now, but I'll, maybe I'll share a crazy moment that I had uh, in the field. And it was, um, grew up in north central Iowa, shotgun deer hunting. 
That was my second year uh, shotgun deer hunting. So, of course, I'm standing out there, you know, and I've got all my dad's friends, and I'm you know, nervous all the time because I don't know if I'm doing the right thing. And we're, we're uh, doing this deer drive, and I'm, I'm standing on this ATV trail along a fence line. I'm one of the post, post guys. And kind of often my own thoughts, much like a, you know, a 12-year-old kid is when you're standing in the field, and, and I can hear this crashing uh, coming, and I couldn't exactly figure out what it was, but I'm standing on this ATV trail, and I look over, and there's this buck running straight down the ATV trail right at me. And, and of course, he's not paying any attention to me because he's looking at the pushers that are behind him. You know, he's kind of looking back over his shoulder as he's running. And I am just shaking. You know, of course, I've got this shotgun in my hand. It's like I don't even know what to do. I'm, this thing's running right at me. And it gets no further than probably five feet away. And he looks up and just goes, puts on the brakes. <laughs> <laughs> and we just kind of had this stare down for a minute. And I'm sitting, I'm sure he's thinking, like, please don't shoot me. And I'm thinking, please don't run me over. <laughs> and... He hopped over the fence and took off running, and I didn't even fire a shot. <laughs> I think I was just so dumbfounded about it, almost getting plowed over by a whitetail that I didn't even know how to react. And your dad doesn't know anything about it, right? At least that day he did I think I, th that day he didn't, for sure. <laughs> uh, I probably told him that story after the fact. But Yeah, that buck's probably been on some podcasts saying answering the same question hey what's the craziest things happen yeah, to you right. while you've been chased while hunting right i wow. ran right up on this guy and he didn't even shoot at me <laughs> well it's it's been a simp it's simply been a great pleasure and like i said an honor and uh you know the the, the work that you do and the uh you know the data that you collect uh certainly this podcast and has brought brighter light to that and uh really thankful for the time that you spent with us Tim, any uh, final words from your standpoint? No, trim tab. Trim tab. Society. I'm going to remember is, trim tab. Yeah. I'm going to remember this experience. Might too. be the <laughs> title of this episode. We'll never know. There right? we go. But, uh, well, thank you, guys. I really appreciate yeah, the time. Yeah, this thank has been you. Fun. It's been beautiful, awesome. beautiful place. If you ever get an opportunity to come around the Boone area, it's a beautiful area. Yeah, absolutely. So, but we close all our uh, podcasts with, you know, be, be safe, safe, have fun, fun and get, and get outdoors. outdoors. Thanks for listening or watching our show. We have some exciting topics and guests coming up. We ask that you subscribe to our channel on YouTube and follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. We look forward to hearing your suggestions for topics, questions, and comments. This is Two Dumbasses signing off. Until next time, be, be safe, safe, have, have fun, fun, and, and get, get outdoors. outdoors.